I didn't start out researching this with the intention of making a project. I was just in the mood to fill in some of the gaps in my own knowledge by exploring a major blind spot of mine in the Crush Gals. Regardless of what your opinion on them may be, the history of pro wrestling cannot be told without the Crush Gals. They are one of the most popular and influential acts in the history of Japanese pro wrestling, and they are worth studying no matter what. The more engrossed I got with my watch list, I eventually decided I might as well make this a part of my broader Greatest Wrestlers Ever research. As I've mentioned in a previous video, there's a concerted fan-driven effort to create a Top 100 Greatest Wrestlers Ever list every 10 years. I'm hopeful that I'll be able to submit a ballot of 100 wrestlers by 2026, and I'll be looking to share my ballot once it's finalized as well. Fingers crossed, at least. So I decided to make sure I at least saw the greatest hits of the Crush Gals, both as a team and individuals. And I also added in a few random interesting matches into the mix as well, so that I could get a decent picture of both women's careers and where I personally stand on them. To that end, I watched 94 matches between 1982 and 2019. In practice, it really is more of 82 to 2000. Then I tacked on Chigusa's quote-unquote retirement match against Takumi Iroha from 2019. It's important for me to emphasize that my research focused on matches. I must also emphasize that I don't speak Japanese, so any discussions of character work will be primarily via what both women display in the ring and action-based angles and segments. So just in general, expect the entirety of this video to be based on ring work. It's here that I should point out that the footage I'm working with presents interesting challenges to creating a full picture of both women's careers. I think there's enough there to make decent claims about their quality of work, but there are some problems worth mentioning. First is that 1980s Joshi, the period that many consider the Crush Gals' peak, isn't the most accessible footage-wise. There's a good amount of it, but much of what is there is often clipped for time. The same is true for much of the footage from Chigusa's own promotion of Gaia in the 1990s and early 2000s. It can be a real struggle to find some of those matches in full. For that reason, I wouldn't call this watch project all that comprehensive, but I'm quite confident that I've at least sampled the bulk of what makes up both women's cases. Next. While this video will be covering both women as a team, at the end I'll be looking to make my conclusions on them as individual performers. I know that I've ranked teams as a single unit in my personal year-enders, but the GWE project necessitates one wrestler per rank. So expect a lot of comparing and contrast as we move forward. And with all of that out of the way, let's get into it. So first, let's start with the facts. Both women debuted just months apart in 1980 and aren't long from hitting the peak of their careers from there. Based on my own watch list, I have Chigusa's first great match being against Jaguar Yokota in November 1982 and Asuka's coming not that much longer after against Chigusa herself in January 1983. That's a negligible enough difference that I'd say neither of them really have much advantage over the other. By 1984, they've already joined forces as the Crush Gals, and I feel they're both already well into their path to greatness. If I want to be really particular, I would say that while 84 is a strong year for them, 1985 is when the peak truly begins, and they both ride that wave through the 80s until 1989. Looking at that, that's a roughly four-year peak, which feels rather short in comparison to many other high-end GOAT candidates. It's important to note that it's really not their fault. In the 80s and going all the way back in its history, All Japan Women's Pro Wrestling had a mandatory retirement policy 
that meant wrestlers were forced to stop performing once they hit their mid-twenties. This was part of a broader Japanese societal norm that pressured women into having settled down into traditional families by a certain age. What this means for the Crush Gals' case is that at the height of their popularity, and just as they were beginning to develop into what seemed like the best versions of themselves as performers, their momentum just gets immediately cut off at the knees. Both women do eventually return and work well into the 2000s or in Chig's case well into the current decade, but it's important to note that the forced halt to their careers in 1989 greatly affects their development and progression in different ways moving forward. My project shows that we do have great matches from both women in the 80s, 90s, and even the 2000s, but their individual arguments for longevity do diverge the further they get into their careers. Let's put a pin in that though as we'll be coming back to it later. All right, Mark Nolte, before we keep going, it's time to pay the bills. If you're enjoying the video so far, be sure to like and subscribe and leave a comment down below. For more wrestler breakdowns, yearly retrospectives, and the Walking the King's Road series, this is the channel for you, so subscribe and demolish the notification bell. And if you want weekly essays about wrestling delivered straight to your email inbox, be sure to subscribe to Big Egg. Now, back to the video. The 1980s are a big era for some of the best and most influential tag teams of all time. Names like the Midnight Express, the Rock and Roll Express, the Road Warriors, and the Fantastics come to mind. As iconic as all those teams are though, I feel like the Crush Gals were a different kind of beast entirely. The Crush Gals derived much of their popularity not just from their wrestling careers, but by having crossover appeal as pop idols. Following in the footsteps of the likes of Beauty Pair before them, Crush Gals' success in music translated into filling arenas with shrieking, devoted young women who lived and died by the team's every victory and defeat. I know I've made it clear in the past that I don't consider drawing power a particularly compelling criterion, so I want to make a clear distinction here. It's not just the sheer volume of tickets that the Crush Gals sold that's impressive to me here. Instead, it's the overwhelming connection to their fan base that created an atmosphere in their matches that is unmatched anywhere else in pro wrestling history. That's a big factor in how these matches come across on footage, and it does a lot to enhance both women's performances as well. To put some more focus on these performances, there's a very clear dynamic established rather early on with the Crush Gals. While there's no broad gap in quality between the two at the time, different things are asked of Chigusa and Asuka. More often than not, Chig gets cast in the role of the face in peril, a fiery underdog that the opponents are able to deliver a beat down to, while Asuka plays a much more self-assured ass kicker that can clean house during a hot tag. They'll take turns receiving a beating now and then, but for much of their most famous run, those are the roles that they play and it works well for them. Chig's incredibly adept at drawing sympathy and displaying a constant sense of struggle in the ring, while Asuka's more impactful offense allows her to take on a big sister role in the pair. It's a simple dynamic that works to not only drive their already devoted fanbase wild, but also translates quite well into more unfamiliar surroundings. Take for example their match against Lola Gonzalez and Rosa Maria for UWA in Mexico. The Crush Gals' charismatic babyface performances allow them to curry favor with the crowd in spite of not being able to fly their pom-pom wielding cheering section out with them. None of their matches are quite as rigidly structured as the very best southern tags of the 80s. As with a lot of Joshi, there's a much more fluid approach to transitions, even in tag team matches. But even then, they had signature double team maneuvers that they knew how to incorporate into their matches and create tension and release around them. 
Something as simple as turning a double palm strike into one of the most electric and over moves in Japan, it really does my heart good to see. For example, while we don't quite have old school heel cutoffs in the vein of the Midnight Express, we have the Crush Gals instead having a signature miscommunication spot that creates openings for their opposition. I often consider spots like that better suited to heel teams, but I think the Crush Gals were able to utilize it to great effect in order to create some doubt over their eventual victory. Stylistically, Crush Gals matches from this time fall broadly into two different camps. Firstly, there's the high-octane all-action matches wrestled at a crazy pace that never really lets up. This is best exemplified by their series against the Jumping Bomb Angels, but they excel at it quite early against teams made up of the likes of Devil Masami, Yukari Omori, and Jaguar Yokota. The other primary genre of Crush Gals tag at this time was the more heat-driven brawls that they had against the various members of the Atrocious Alliance. This is one of the most iconic Crush Gals feuds and saw our heroes take on Dump Matsumoto and a series of rotating partners in Crane Yu, Bull Nakano, Condor Saito, etc. These were characterized more with a lot of cheating from the heels, the introduction of weapons, constant interference, blood, and even mid-match promos. While the high-octane matches deliver at the higher levels a little bit more consistently, I feel like it's the Atrocious Alliance brawls that really come across as a little more instructive. It's here where we really see the emotional heights of the fans' connection to the Crush Gals. Dump and her band of misfits take great joy in battering our heroes, and it's in their valiant attempts to fight back that we see the Crush Gals transformed from a talented team to these hardened, badass heroes willing to fight off the whole world on their own if necessary. One really gets a sense of why the Crush Gals were so beloved in this particular feud. Neither woman takes any crap from anybody, whether that's crooked referees or the constant onslaught of dumps cronies that she puts in their path. I don't think any match displays this better than the 1985 Tag League The Best final against Dump Matsumoto and Bull Nakano. They're faced against a veritable army of enemies in the Atrocious Alliance, and there's injustice and chicanery at every turn. It's a grand spectacle of everything and the kitchen sink thrown at our heroes and seeing how they continue to fight against an irrepressible tide. It's awesome. We never really get a Crush Gals heel run in the 80s, but we do see some more versatility in their roles later in the decade. Working against the likes of the Marine Wolves in 1989 showed that Crush Gals could function perfectly well as a veteran team that younger units had to overcome. Before we really get a chance to explore that dynamic further though, both women are forced to retire. The last match I watched from these two women as a team came from the 5th anniversary show of Gaia in the year 2000. In this, they're basically playing the hits of a Crush Gals match against a team of Devil Masami and Akira Hokuto. The match is good, but it does show just how much of the Crush Gals' matches is entirely reliant on that rabid fanbase. They hit all their signature spots, and the crowd is with them for the momentous occasion, but all this time later, the holes in the routine are a little more obvious than before. A little loose, a little unstructured, but still enjoyable as a reunion match designed to play the hits and not much else. One thing that hinders the Crush Gals' case as one of the greatest tag teams ever is actually a common problem with tag teams anywhere in any era. Their peak is actually far shorter than it looks on the surface. They form in 1983 and are pretty great from the word go, but both women are forced to retire in 1989. But there's actually a rather lengthy period in 1986 where the two also stopped teaming due to Lioness Asuka tiring of the pop idol lifestyle. That really only leaves us with about four years of their peak run that much of their case is based on, 
and then the post-peak stuff in the 2000s. I think that despite this short run, though, Crush Gals are still within the upper tiers of all-time tag teams. Not only do they have the performances and matches to back it up, but I put a lot of stock in the fact that they became a massive top-end attraction specifically for being a tag team instead of just two popular singles wrestlers crammed together. Even with their abbreviated run, I think the highs of what they achieve easily puts them in the conversation. I can't say I've done a concerted study on top-level tag teams of late, but my gut tells me that they're no less than a top 10 tag team ever once we take everything into account, and that's quite a boon for both women individually as well. Conventional wisdom amongst fans seems to hold that Chigusa Nagayo is the superior of the two. I'm certainly not going to be disputing that, but it's definitely worth breaking down the reasons why I believe this to be true. For now, I'll be focusing on both women's individual work during their peak run in the 80s. In this time period, I don't actually believe that the gap between Chigusa and Asuka is as wide as some people might believe. In fact, I'd say that early on in both their careers, it's not impossible to say that Asuka felt like a much more fully formed worker much sooner in her development. The badass aura that she brings to the team shines through, and she feels like a much more credible threat than Chigusa for quite a while. It helps her case as well that of the two, she has some of the flashier offense with a bigger emphasis on power moves and that signature giant swing, as well as her competence down on the mat. In terms of singles matches, I don't know that Asuka's all that far behind Chigusa as well. I definitely think that Chigusa peaks higher, but Asuka's big singles matches against the likes of Jaguar Yokota from the famed August 22nd, 1985 Budokan show, or the bout against Devil Masami from April 5th, 1986 Sumo Hall show, all set a rather high bar for what she can do on her own. That's not even getting into the matches that she wrestles against Chig, which we'll get into a little more later on. I think my one real spicy take about Lioness Asuka in the 1980s, though, is that, by my estimation, she's the better Dump Matsumoto singles opponent. I know, I know, the Chigusa Dump matches, especially the two hair matches in 85 and 86, are canonical and iconic parts of pro wrestling history. And it's not hard to see why. The atmosphere is so strong, and the emotional weight behind Chigusa's defeat in the first, and then her eventual victory in the second, do radiate off the screen all these years later. But the dynamic always seemed a little bit confused to me. Despite having had ample time to prove herself as a singles competitor in both 85 and 86, she spends so much of these matches feeling like a victim of dumps instead of an opponent on her level. I understand that a lot of that comes from dumps cheating and the interference of her cronies at ringside, but Chigusa had long proven herself not only willing but capable of confronting these challenges head on, and something about her giving up so much of these matches to dump just kind of felt off. It works well enough in the first hair match, which I believe is the best Chig Dump match. That's meant to set up the big tragedy and defeat, but it does kind of ring hollow in the 86 hair match, seeing Chig just getting absolutely thrashed. The 1986 hair match feels especially strange because earlier in the year we see Chig and Dump wrestle in Sumo Hall for the vacated white belt. This match feels much more like a natural extension of their first hair match, with Chig finding herself on more even footing when in a straight wrestling match, and then finding her strength to take on Dump once all the shenanigans get involved. Asuka never has to deal with the weight of these expectations. True, 
Her matches with Dump are never quite as high stakes as two very emotionally fueled apuestas, but Asuka's solid character lends a consistency that Chig can't quite match. Asuka's badass nature makes for a strong foil to Dump's malicious violence. Asuka comes around, takes no shit from Dump, and continues to fight her way through. She has less room to make herself a sympathetic figure in the story, sure, but that just results in matches that I found delivered in stronger ways than Chig's matches against Dump. So far, what I've been able to praise most about Asuka is her consistency both in the ring and as a character. It is both her greatest strength, but also what ends up making her case far less compelling when juxtaposed with Chigusa's. Chigusa's positioning as more of the underdog in the team means that she's able to have a much more compelling arc as a performer. Watching her improvement and rise in the ranks is just far more interesting than anything Asuka's got going on, and it allows her to display her versatility much more. Chig spends most of the early 80s getting her ass kicked. In that sense, she develops a very clear persona as an underdog in spite of her fiery charisma. It's that baseline persona that makes her progression through the 80s so gratifying. By the time we get to 1985, she's able to grow into her position as a top-level attraction for the company by showing she can hold her own as a singles wrestler. 1985's a crucial year for Chigusa, as within less than a week's time, she has two huge matches that basically solidify her entire legacy for generations to come. First, on August 22nd, she wrestles what might be one of the greatest matches of all time against Devil Masami in Budokan Hall. It's a match that sees Chig push to her absolute limit as a technician on the mat, then just as a straight-up fighter trading blows with Masami in the closing stretch. Only six days later, she has the iconic first hair match against Dump Matsumoto that we've already discussed previously. From there, she starts really displaying her best qualities as an individual performer. Mechanically, her kicks become stiffer and continue to do so as the years go by. Her mat work develops a real struggle-filled dynamism that makes her engaging to watch even when she's just trying to escape a simple hold or elevate her shoulders off the mat to avoid a pin. And of course, her charisma only grows more powerful as she goes from hungry upstart to a more self-assured ace-style figure. While her peak matches do Chigusa's run in the 80s a lot of credit, both in tag and singles bouts, I think that it's some of her more low-stakes performances that shed a little more light on what makes her so special. Take for example the October 10th, 1988 bout against Toshio Yamada. In this, Chig's able to perform as the top-level ace figure who's so far ahead of her competition that it borders on the brutal and mean at points. It's an entirely different vibe to how she performed for years prior, and it serves as a template for what Chig would come to evolve into later down the line. Another example is a January 5th, 1989 street fight against Medusa Michelli. Here we have an honest-to-goodness southern babyface cowboy Chigusa Nagayo. I was stunned to see it. Chigusa coming to the ring bloody, in street clothes, swinging a chain around, using her boot as a weapon. It's so fucking cool. Honestly, one of the coolest one-night transformations I can recall in pro wrestling, and Chig slips right into it with ease, as it feels like a natural exploration of her experience brawling with the Atrocious Alliance. It's cowboy street fighter Chigusa Nagayo, man. It rocks! <laughs> One of the things I should make clear before going into this is that the Crush Gals are fighting a bit of an uphill battle for me personally, just as a circumstance of time and place. Stylistically speaking, I wouldn't really count 80s Joshi as my personal favorite. After having watched so much of it for this project, I'd say it's still a little bit of an acquired taste, 
even when it's great. There are some hallmarks of the style at the time that mar the Crush Gals' individual cases for me. I've already alluded to the fact that I don't count structure as either Chig or Asuka's strengths as workers. That manifests in a few ways. Some obvious ones to point to are a general disregard for long-term limb selling. Both women, and Chig in particular, do well to sell limb work in the moment, but it's a very rare occasion to see limb work be a plot point carried through the rest of the match. Perhaps one of the only exceptions that come to mind is the 1988 Red Belt title match between Lioness Asuka and Chigusa Nagayo. At one point in the match, Chigusa injures an arm and it becomes a focal point of the narrative all the way to the finish. Of course, that's mostly because, as far as I can tell, Chigusa actually injured her arm. So this isn't really an artistic choice so much as a freak accident. I'm not saying that every wrestler needs to have a great limb selling performance, although it does help display their range. But rather, I point this out as a symptom of the larger issue that I find the Crush Gals have a very loose approach to putting together matches. If you come in expecting a strict A to B logical progression, you're not always going to get that from them. It's a worse problem in some of their matches than others. I think part of what makes this point especially frustrating about the Crush Gals is that I know that they're at least capable of putting together a match with a strong narrative through line as evidenced by one of their best matches together. Some of the most famous singles matches that either women have in their careers are the ones they have against each other. I've already mentioned their first match in 1983 from before they began teaming, but it's the ones that come after their meteoric rise that really deserve the most scrutiny and appreciation. The most famous of these matches in 85 and 87 end in time limit draws. The latter is especially notable for Asuka being awarded a victory by referee decision in spite of both women surviving an overtime. This sets up a great dynamic of Chigusa constantly chasing the day when she can finally get the best of her partner. That brings us to the January 29th, 1989 Red Belt title match between the two. The setup is quite simple. The red belt has been vacant since the title match the year prior where Chigusa injured her arm. Asuka relinquished the title on the spot after being awarded the victory, and now the two finally get the chance to settle the matter with Chigusa recovered. This match takes full advantage of the development that we've seen from Chigusa over the course of the decade. For the first time, she doesn't feel like Asuka's lesser within the narrative of the match. In fact, for most of the match, it feels like Chig's finally solved Asuka. She has an answer to everything that Asuka throws at her, best shown at one point when she blocks the giant swing with a straight punch to the face. And yet, she still loses. Asuka's able to rally back, and then reality sets in for Chig as she suffers yet another loss. It's such a great story, one that feels purposeful and deliberate, there's a real tragedy to it, both within the narrative and beyond. The match feels like it's gearing towards Chig finally getting her win, but there's many reasons why that can't happen. The main one being that Chig's only four months away from her first retirement. Oh look, it's that dumb retirement rule again. In my opinion, it's probably the best match that Lioness Asuka ever had, and perhaps the best individual performance of Chig's, if not quite her best match as a whole. It's a neat little bow that both women put on the first run of their careers, and a constant reminder of what could have been if they had simply been allowed to keep going. Oh and yes, better than 6394. This match has a similar tragic narrative, with a wrestler finally trying to get a big win over someone they've teamed with for years, and it ends in defeat for both Chig and Kawada. But this match just takes a much more focused approach to that narrative than the famed Triple Crown bout. 
well worth the watch. Your study of the Crush Gals truly isn't complete without it. With the 90s came a much broader landscape for women's wrestlers in Japan. While AJW remained the oldest and most dominant promotion, they were no longer the only game in town with the rise of promotions like JWP or LLPW. This is important because none of those other companies featured mandatory retirements, which opened up a whole host of new career options for women wrestling in Japan. In the early 90s, AJW tried to maximize this revitalized Joshi landscape by collaborating with their competitors for several programs and mega shows. Among the most famous of these is, of course, Dream Slam. It's at Dream Slam that we see the return to AJW of two of its most important figures from the 1980s. First is Devil Masami, who in the intervening years had become a JWP regular. Then, fighting against her, coming back for her first match in four years was Chigusa Nagayo. For a first match back from a forced retirement, this rules. Masami is definitely Chigusa's best opponent in her entire career, and their chemistry shines through here once more. But what shines through the most is how Chigusa has changed as a worker. There's a less frantic energy to her movements and work at this point. She's still greatly charismatic, but in a way that's different from her 1980s run. She now feels like the natural evolution of what she showed in the Yamada match or in the street fight against Medusa. In this match, Chigusa exudes a confidence that makes her feel like a near, untouchable force. There's a harder edge to her persona and her movements in the 90s. It's not just that she came back and was as good as before. She came back and wrestled as if she never stopped. It's almost as if those four years were filled with her changing and evolving as she always did as a character, and we were just now seeing what it had turned her into. It's a stunning transformation, and one that I feel does her great credit in terms of evaluating her career. Chigusa would continue down this path for the rest of the 90s. As a certified living legend, she wrestled far more like an ace and shed the more underdog elements of her character. She coupled this with a change in her ring work. She bulked up and placed a greater emphasis on power moves that worked especially well given that many of the people she worked with in the 90s were far smaller than her. That lends itself to strong bullying performances for Chigusa, where now she's the domineering force younger wrestlers push up against. Perhaps my favorite in this genre would be a tag match from February 16th, 1997, which saw Chig team with Akira Hokuto against Kaoru and Maiko Matsumoto. Chig and Hokuto are such a great, brutish murder duo in this, and it feels unlike so much of Chig's 80s work in the best way possible. The 90s also allow us to get a glimpse of Chigusa as a heelish figure. I'm not exactly sure if there's a well-defined intentional heel turn for her, but there are several matches where she has a far more antagonistic relationship with the crowd. There's her February 1994 bout against Plum Mariko in JWP, and then later on, her street fight in Gea against Mayumi Ozaki in 1997. The 90s aren't exactly littered with great matches for Chigusa, especially because unclipped Gea match footage can be pretty hard to come by, but it's seeing her shift up her game to be pretty much a completely different worker that makes it worth seeing. The 90s are not nearly so kind to Lioness Asuka as they are to Chigusa Nagayo. Yet again, it's her steady consistency that mars her case in the 90s for me. Stylistically and aesthetically, there's not much that Asuka does to switch up her game, especially during her return to AJW. Where Chig felt like she turned into an entirely new version of herself, Asuka felt like a woman out of time. The AJW crowds had changed from what they were in the 80s, no longer the screeching young girls shaking pom-poms, and now a more 
male-centric pro-wrestling crowd. Asuka isn't a superhero to these people, and she unfortunately feels a bit more like a relic from a time gone by. It also doesn't help that the work of hers I did enjoy most from the 90s footage I found is just her playing the hits with a familiar foe and eventual partner, Jaguar Yokota. Everything I saw from the 90s for Asuka, which, to be fair, wasn't much, seemed to suggest that her best days were definitely behind her. She doesn't suddenly start wrestling worse, but the scene feels like it has left her behind. Perhaps the best match of Asuka's from this decade comes right at 1999, when she reignites the feud against Chigusa in Gaia. Here we get to see a heel Asuka who's pivoted her ring work towards more plunder brawls and cheating. I think the Gaia 4th anniversary match is the best of this bunch with the Crush Gals escalating their way through the hardcore elements before finishing up with a sick fireball finish to give Asuka yet another win over Chigusa. Their rematch in September works less well for me for how unfocused I find the structure moving from plunder brawling back to regular work and then back to a finale of Chig spitting fire in Asuka's face. Great finish, but the match is less so. The glimpses I caught of Asuka from the 90s don't really offer me much hope in regards to her GW case lining up with Chigusa. While I find that they're closer in quality in the 80s than some might have you believe, it's the 90s where the gulf between them really broadens. Asuka's longevity case really suffers in the 90s as I found her attempts to adapt to the times far less effective and interesting than Chig's. I don't think any attempt to rank the greatest wrestlers of all time can be complete without studying both of the Crush Gals, regardless of one's eventual conclusions about them. For myself, I think that the Crush Gals' case as one of the greatest tag teams ever might just be stronger than either woman's case individually. There's a smaller pool of competition in the greatest tag team ever discussion, and I think they clear the bar quite easily even with their abbreviated peak run. That being said, I do think the case is there for both women to be in the greatest wrestler ever conversation. For me personally though, I don't see myself ranking either woman in the higher reaches of a list of 100. Chigusa definitely has the stronger case with a higher peak, greater longevity, and a more impressive versatility case on her side. While I definitely appreciate Asuka's work in the 80s at her peak, I just don't think there's enough there to help her clear the bar and make it onto the list of 100. With Chigusa, I think she might find herself somewhere in the middle or bottom half of my top 100. For me, the biggest points keeping her out of the upper reaches of the discussion are the lack of viable footage from the 90s, as well as my own stylistic preferences not generally siding with her to begin with. And to be quite frank, even at Chigusa's peak in 1980s AJW, I'm not even convinced that she was the best wrestler among her contemporaries, but that's a story for another time. If you are at all interested in an overview of the Crush Gals' career, here are some matches that I'd recommend seeing. For the Crush Gals as a tag team, check out these matches on the screen. For Lioness Asuka as an individual worker, here are some matches. And for Chigusa, you can check these out. Check out any and all of the Chigusa vs. Asuka singles matches with special emphasis on the one from February 26th, 1987 and January 29th, 1989. I feel like all of these matches will provide a decent sampler for you to make some initial conclusions about both women and then allow you to dig deeper from there. The Crush Gals' impact on pro wrestling history truly cannot be understated. The story of women's wrestling in Japan, and therefore in the world, cannot be told without them. Countless top stars in Joshi from the 90s onward cite them as important influences, and that through line of influence can be felt even today. At their best, they reached an entire generation of young women and made them believe 
wholeheartedly in the magic of pro wrestling. Really think about that. It's not something that too many others of any gender can claim to have done. Thank you, everybody, for making it to the end of the video. Since you got here, I want to send a very special thank you to Sam, the VA mod, for helping edit the video, and to RNKF Shirts for the work that they did helping put together the title sequence. And, of course, I want to send a massive thank you to all of my supporters over on Ko-fi. Thank you to one-time supporters in Evan and at Verb Abrams. And thank you to my monthly supporters in James Draper, Captain Jack Heartless, Eddie Roberts, Jacob Dickens, Chick Fritz, Spiders in My Bed, Timothy R. Buchner, in Delane. Dunn. Automatic Peter Vinison, Kid King Pin, Joe Humphreys, Christopher Jackson, Saltine Dalton, Dustin Faulkner, Four Pillars of Hell, Sean Emily, Mason Rollison, Carve Cutta, Jacob VR, Craig Jones, Merch Table Mafia, Clem DK, Suit Coat Man, Ando Commando, Con, Shane, Vibe MD, Christoph, Quentin Besnahard, Matthew Haggerty, Christopher Richards, Dom G, Cathal Cully, Austin Shermer, Ben, Wrestling Playlists, Woo! And Francois Duboc. Thank you all so much for sticking around until the end of the video and supporting the channel. You guys are absolutely awesome. Thank you, thank you, thank you, and have a good one.